Robert Putnam, first of all, welcome. You're the author of Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis. Thanks, Rich. It's good to be with you. Very good. And you're also the uh, Malcolm Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University. That's right. And a renowned expert in the area of children in America. The, the general thesis of the book is that the, uh, the opportunity gap is growing for children in America. Well, the, the basic idea is that um, over the course of the last generation or two, there's a growing gap between the resources and the uh, challenges facing rich kids and poor kids in terms of getting ahead in life. There's, the book has a series of what we call scissors graphs in which um, you can see things getting better and better for kids coming from college educated homes. My grandchildren, that, that class in America, they're doing better and better. But on the same measures, kids from working, what we used to call the working class family, that is high school educated homes, are getting worse and worse. So you can see that kind of growing gap in what we call good night moon time, the amount of time that parents spend with their kids. In uh, summer camp time, the amount of money that parents are investing in their kids for summer camp or for piano lessons or for trips to Europe or whatever. Um, you can see it in the quality of the schools they go to, the stability of their families. Um, you can see it in the kind of support that they get or don't get from their communities, the degree to which they're involved in church communities, for example, to take one simple example. So what that means is that increasingly, in terms of your, if you're a kid, your chances for um, making a good living and rising in life and so on are dependent upon one choice, that is choosing your parents. And if you choose, if you choose well and end up with well-educated parents, you're you're fine. Yeah. But if you chose less well-educated parents, then your goose is cooked, and that's fundamentally un-American. That's my basic argument. It just isn't right. It's not consistent with the core values of the American dream. And it, your book tackles everything from um, how much reading time you said, good night, moon time, to how much dinner time you spend all the way up into the college level years and, sure. and the cost of education at that point. Sure. But your point is it really starts at that very beginning. It starts very early, yeah. Um, the gap between rich kids and poor kids is fully formed by the time they get to school. Um, now, I want to be careful. I don't say, and, 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 the, and that the reason is because so many things are going on in those very early years, like your parents reading to you or not. And we know now from the recent brain science that those things, if your parents read to you, that has a powerful effect on your, on your brain development. The most consistent feature, actually, of the lives of poor kids in America now is that they are alone, in part because they live in very unstable families. So most, two-thirds of all kids growing up in high school educated homes in America have are, single, are in single parent homes. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that a single mom can't do a good job of, of raising kids. Of course, many do, but the challenges are much greater in a single parent home, and, and therefore many of these kids don't even have good support from their parents. But they're also disconnected from schools, from religious communities, from neighbors, from mentors, from coaches, because they're increasingly they're no longer involved in sports activities. So they're alone, really alone, and deeply distrustful of everybody. One of the young women that we, whose story we tell in the book posted on Facebook just actually a couple of months ago, love hurts, trust kills. Think what it means to grow up in a world in which you can't trust anybody. And what goes along with that is these kids don't have adults in their lives, or they have many, many fewer adults in their lives than, than, than rich kids do, who can help guide them and say, you know, that's the right math course to take. Or, you know, probably you ought not to, you know, stay out every night, all night. Or if you get in trouble, they're not able to help you. You know, the fundamental feature of being a kid is you get in trouble. All kids, rich kids, poor kids, black kids, white kids get in trouble. But if a kid coming from a well-educated home gets in trouble, you know, they get involved with drugs or they get drunk or they bang the car up or they have a trouble problem at school or whatever, instantly airbags inflate to protect our kids. 
kids coming from college educated homes. But the same thing, if the same exact thing happens to a poor kid, no airbags, no learning opportunity. But airbags are, are there, I mean, the reason that they're valuable is that they allow you to learn from your errors, mm -hmm. from your mistakes, mm -hmm. not to be destroyed by your mistakes. And that's why the absence of airbags in the lives of these kids is, it, it's, it fundamentally impairs their chances of, of, of you know, doing what our, what our kids can do without even, I mean, I don't think even, I don't think rich parents or rich kids even are aware of the way that they're, that we surround our kids with these things. It's just there, but that's not there in the lives of poor kids. And this is, it's fundamentally un-American. I mean that in the deepest sense. This is not the way Americans in the past have handled problems of kids coming from the wrong side of the tracks. It isn't. We've, we've faced this problem before as a country, and we've, we've after sometimes not doing the right thing, after, after a while we do the right thing. So I'm trying to get us to emulate those moments in our own history. And you talk about public high school and, and making Absolutely. high school available uh, to kids and, and that being a step that indicated the way we used to handle things like that. Exactly right. The, the last period in American history that was really like the period we're in now um, was the turn of the 19th to the 20th century when that was the last time we had a growth of income gap, the economic gap was as great as it is now in America. The Gilded Age it was called and that was the year of the rob Perry of the Robber Barons and, and a lot of really poor poor kids and, and slums and so on in the country. But as people gradually became aware of how great was the opportunity gap in that period, ordinary people in places all around America, in, it began actually in small towns in, uh, in Iowa and Kansas, got the idea of high schools, free public secondary edu education for all the kids in town. God did not invent high schools. In high schools were invented by social reformers place, facing a problem, a challenge, very much like the one we face today. I'm not saying now we need to reinvent high schools. That's not my point. My point is the idea that everybody in town should pay for everybody's kids in town to have a decent start, a fair, you know, a, 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 an equal chance. That's what the high school was. The high school, invention of the high school benefited the whole country because it raised the whole quality of what economists call um, human capital uh, for, for most of a century actually. Our prosperity in the 20th century was rooted in that, in, in that good idea, the high school, as was high rates, uh, having a high rate of social mobility because everybody got the same education. And I'm, what I, what I want to have happen in America now is not have us become like Sweden or something like that. I just want to go back to our own roots in well, which wait, we did that kind of thing. How do you explain the, um, how, do, how do we tackle the empathy gap? How do we tackle the fact that other people need to actually worry about kids that aren't their own? Well, I think, I think it is partly actually a, a moral uh, problem, and I think we have to make that point clear. And, I, and, and, and so that's, that is part of it. But I wanna, the other thing I want to say really very clearly is this is not a zero-sum game. It's not the case that if we help you know, poor kids, it's going to be worse for my kids. Quite the contrary. Poor kids, as they get older and, and you know, go through life, are expensive. The, the best economic estimate of the cost of not investing in these 23 million poor kids in America is some, over their lifetime, I mean, is something like four, sorry, seven trillion dollars. That's trillion with a T. And why is that? You might say, well, why are they going to be so expensive? Let's just ignore them. The answer is we got the criminal justice system that there is going to be, have to be much more robust and we're going to spend a lot more on prisons and, and you know, courts and so on. That's actually not the worst of it. Health, these folks are going to be really unhealthy because they don't follow even now good health habits. They're more obese and that means they're going to have more diabetes earlier and we're all going to have to pay for that somehow. And then, but most important, the skills, the potential talents of these 23 million kids will not be contributing to our national economic growth. There are some awfully smart kids in that 23 million and they're in principle if they had the right preparation they'd invent marvelous things we can't even imagine but we're going to miss that because we didn't think that those kids ought to be thought of as our kids. Our kids, my own biological grandchildren are going to be worse off if we don't invest in these other kids. You've seen um, recently President Obama talk about uh, community colleges perhaps being yeah. free or a lower cost. 
uh, there are some countries, um, Germany comes to mind, where uh, college is free for, for everyone. Do you think that we're, we're nearing a, a, a point where people will be able to come in and get college education like a high school education? Are, is there any movement on that front? Well, there is. I have to say, and I think that'd be great to have free, um, free at least for free, uh, free community colleges. I think it'd be great. But actually, I have to say the problem it's what we talked about before. The it's problem begins earlier. much, yeah. much earlier. And so my nominee for the equivalent of the high school in the 21st century is actually early childhood education, beginning really quite early, one, two, three years old. We know the research shows that high quality early childhood education, I don't mean just babysitting, I mean actually with serious professional teachers working with kids, makes a big difference. It's expensive because you're paying, you have to these, pay these teachers well to do their work, but the returns are vastly outweigh the, the costs. And so that's my nomination, because if you could begin to address the problem really early, then the problem wouldn't be nearly so great later on. But it's not just you know expensive, big national problems like that. I think we also need to think about, actually, in our own towns, all of us live in towns where there are poor kids like this, and they, those kids need adult support from us, and that we could do. I mean, I think that's, I don't think that, that serious mentoring is the sole solution to this problem, of course I don't, but it's something that all of us could do mm -hmm. to begin to narrow this opportunity gap. And I think that maybe there might be a generation coming up now that is beginning to understand that, they're yeah. seeing the weight of it. Um, with, with hope, we're coming out of an era where we were sort of looking the other way. Yeah, I actually, I agree with that very much. I'm actually quite optimistic. I'm optimistic because I think if people understood what, how bad the problem is now, and because the country has become more segregated in class terms, many people just aren't aware right. of the lives of poor kids. And, you know, there have been earlier periods in American history when people have written books that basically simply said to rich folks in town, actually, do you know what it's like living in, in the other end of town? The, the book uh, published in, the eight, in 1890 called How the Other Half Lives, mm -hmm. a book by a journalist, basically just described life in the tenements of the Lower East Side of New York to the readers right. in the Silk Stocking Districts. It. You have to feel it. Yeah, and, and if you see that, and that was actually, I don't want to make this sound warm and cuddly and gooey, but actually, once you began to see what the problem was like, right. it's hard to walk away from it. Right. Well, books like yours are helping to shed light on that situation. I hope there are other things, but your passion is absolutely admirable, and I think that that's, it'll help others get inspired as well. I think there is another generation coming up I that seem too. really excited about it. And thank you for all the work you've done, and the book, really wonderful. I appreciate everything. Thanks very much. Yeah, I appreciate great to meet your, you. your interview, Richard. Thanks.